we'll get underway now with our content on designing places that foster social connection during COVID. Uh, you will get one HSW credit for attending today's session. We ask you to stick around for the full hour in order to obtain that credit. We also remind you that the Q&A function is available and uh, we are anxious to have the audience participate in the conversation today. You can use that in your Zoom profile bar. It's at the bottom of the page and I'll be monitoring those questions and getting them into the conversation. Uh, just as many as we can get to. So our presenters today, um, backed by popular demand, if you were at the, uh, the practice and design conference we had last fall in October in Breckenridge, this was one of our very popular uh, breakout sessions. Uh, and it was talking about places that foster social collision. Of course, no one back then knew that COVID-19 would happen. And that seems like a lifetime ago in October. Um, but it's here and we are all dealing with it in our own ways. And there are some techniques that we can use to make the places that we all know and love even more appropriate to the social construct that we're dealing with today. Our two presenters, uh, I'll start with Louise. Louise Bordelon is an assistant professor and the interim chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at UC Denver. Louise studied architecture at the University of Cape Town and did a master's in landscape architecture at LSU where she was a Fulbright scholar. Her PhD is in geography and anthropology, and her published work and research is on hand drawing, landscape, tourism, and mountain biking. But don't do them all at the same time. Uh, she currently teaches in the Integral inter Interdisciplinary Studio at UC Denver. Hi, Louise, and welcome. Thank you. And we have Laurel Rains. Laurel is an ASLA and PLA in the Dig Studio Principal and Partner. As founding principal and president of Dig Studio, which has locations in Denver and Phoenix, her built works include award-winning projects of varying scales and complexities that contribute to the well-being and health of communities and the environment. One practice area which Laurel has consistently been engaged in is park and play environments, having led numerous park recreation center performance venues and parkways from planning through design and implementation. Most recently, she's serving as principal in charge of Paco Sanchez Park in Denver, a new generation of parks which promote multi-generational health in the neighborhood through design and layout of the play experience. Welcome, Laurel. Thank you. All right. I know this is a very interactive session amongst the two of you, um, so I look forward to hearing how it's differed between uh, now and October, and take it away. Okay. So we, we started the same slide last time, and the picture of me is one of my favorites. It's a moment that we captured at the top of the tower at Paco Sanchez Park. Uh, those little kids came up and they said to the, each other, this is the coolest place on, in the world. And I turned to them and I said, I designed this. And that was their expression when they heard that. <laughs> so it just takes, brings out the reason why I love to do what we do. It really makes a difference in people's lives. It helps bring people together. It helps people um, engage with each other, get outside and in the environment. And it, it really is an important part of the world, bringing people into public spaces. And um, this picture is a picture of the first ever studio that I took on a, that I taught and that I took on a field trip to Chicago. And my um, sort of motivation to be a teacher comes from my own experience as a student, which was oftentimes traumatic, um, lack of sleep, just downright terrible. It took me about three years to recover from design school. And I work really hard to try and help students have a positive experience. And um, the highest compliment is one of these students is now teaching. So I, that was, that's really special for me. So moving on to uh, social collisions, we actually changed the name to social connections because nobody wants to collide anymore. Um, this is not a new issue. So this is a, a cartoon from the Punch magazine in, uh, with forecasts for 1907. And you can see two people are sitting in the park, but they're both on their own wireless machine and they're not talking to each other. It's also a really dangerous issue. Loneliness, two out of 10 Americans reported loneliness or social isolation, half of them saying they had one or no confidence. 
In a study by Cigna, they found that 18 to 22 year olds were the loneliest um, contingent of the population, which is really alarming. That should be the group of people that's connecting socially and um, living it up. So the health implications of loneliness, lonely, being lonely is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. High risk of heart attack, diabetes, vulnerability to depression, mental illness. There, there are a lot of things about being lonely. And one of the things that really surprised us was we discovered that the UK now has a minister of loneliness. They felt it was important enough to um, establish somebody to really look into this. So how can we combat being lonely? <laughs> And then one of the things that we thought about since presenting this last fall was if we thought loneliness was an issue then, an epidemic then, it is obviously even worse now. People are stuck in their homes or have been for quite a while and not being able to um, meet with each other, not to be able to see each other, just be in a space where they can connect. Um, I recently saw a video that some of the um, downtown Denver leadership program people were involved in and they were asking people what is the public realm and, the, and what the biggest answer was a place to see people just simply see and be with each other so that importance of the public realm now is even more than it ever has been and when we did this we identified these other issues that you you, know, you feel rejuvenated you it boosts your immune system it increases your um, creativity, it helps your eyes. But back to the loneliness issue, it just, just being around other humans helps to prevent um, us from becoming disconnected and therefore misunderstanding each other and therefore increasing the likelihood of conflict. So it is really essential. When looking at the urban form today versus looking at it prior to COVID, this was a, a part of a webinar where they polled people about what their feelings are about visiting a park or an open space. And you can see the number one most um, important one, the one that's in red, is physical distancing because of COVID-19. So that brings us to the idea that we've been talking about, how do you design spaces that um, encourage connections, but allow for that physical distancing that everyone's become keenly aware of the importance of. When we, when, we, when we did this before, we talked about these two images. And one of the things we said was, OK, you look at these two images. They happen to be the same street. Um, you can notice by the buildings in the background. But the one on the bottom, obviously, is the kind of street we all want to design. We want to create places where there's in and out from the ground floor level, retail, restaurants, trees, um, comfortable places to sit, and having the aspect of having a big open parking lot next to a sidewalk, it's a very uninviting space. But we also identified the, the point was, now you can look at that, un, that open space, and even then we said this, you can look at that open space and go, opportunity. Opportunity to let people spill out into a greater, um, a larger space and be able to distance themselves from each other and still provide activities, programming that bring them there instead of having them in their homes. So when we were revisiting our presentation, we, we realized how much our perceptions had changed because these are two images that we showed and, and said, these are just terrible. <laughs> so the first one is the snoofer bench, the sofa bench, I think. And it's a, a place where you can charge your phone outside. And we said, this is terrible. This person is missing the outdoors. They are not connecting with other people. And now we think, well, actually, that's kind of great because she's outside at least and she gets to see other people and not, she's not stuck inside an apartment. And then Parc de la Villette, we said, these chairs are terrible. They face away from each other. And now we think, hmm, actually, that would be kind of a good idea. Maybe I would sit there. So it's just, it's really, uh, this brought about the um, importance of flexibility in the spaces that we design. So why do we want to design spaces that foster social collisions? We want to do it so that people will come, so that they'll, they'll hang out, they'll stay, 
And the way to do it is to get, to make people feel comfortable, to make people feel safe, which now includes safe for, for health reasons. Um, make people feel welcome in this issue, with our issues with Black Lives Matter and diversity inclusion, the fact that we wanna make sure that everyone feels invited to spaces, that spaces, and maybe that's by um, defining spaces that reach out to all different age groups as well as all different cultural groups, but that so people feel included and not excluded. And we're focusing because this is what we do on the public realm, but this public realm, as I mentioned before, is even more important because you can't hang out in the lobby of your apartment building very well. Getting outside is the place to be um, in, the, in our parks, in our plazas, in our streets, in our alleys, anywhere on rooftops, anywhere that you can get outside and enjoy the environment and not be too close. We, were, we used this premise that the way to design these places was to use ideas of reclaiming spaces that are available to us, of emphasizing and um, promoting culture, of using the idea of storytelling or narrative to make the design more meaningful to the culture and to the people who use it, creating a sense of discovery so that you'll come again and again. If, if, there's, if everything's just open to you the very first time you come or there's only one idea there, you're not going to come as often. Like Highline is a beautiful example of that, that you go there and you discover a linear system of things to observe and enjoy. The idea of introducing play, that play can be introduced in any environment, interior and exterior, um, and play can be for all ages. It can be for adults as well for families and children. And then the idea that programming needs to be provided and varied and that we need to design spaces that are flexible and programmable in multiple ways. And then revisioning this for, or revising this for COVID-19, um, we're looking at re reclaiming or repurposing spaces. Um, when we integrate culture, it needs to be local. Um, the narrative should be inclusive. Discovery should be adaptable, play is undefined, and programming is delineated or spaced. So these are some examples of places that have been repurposed. The Bentway project, where you can see there's a wrestling match ha happening underneath the underpass. And then A. Beckett Park in um, Melbourne, outside the RMIT University. And what these spaces really do is they just take forgotten spaces and reinvent them as social spaces. And they're not expensive. They're, they can be temporary, most of the time they are. Um, and one of my favorite things about the A. Beckett Urban Square is that they didn't even use plants. They just, they just painted green on the walls and it transformed it into a sort of a, an outdoor green space. You can tell, Louise, when you look at that one, that it actually was a parking lot, just like that parking lot that we showed in the earlier slide, mm -hmm. that here you took a parking lot and trade, created a park out of it by rolling out AstroTurf and painting surfaces, and it's transformed. And this was, this was designated for development, and I do wonder if that development, I don't know whether it went ahead, but they, they, this was a temporary measure to use that space. Um, but I think it was really successful. And then in um, Medellin in Colombia, there are streets being closed. People are, you know, every Sunday, I think it is, the, the streets are closed to cars and everyone can, can get out on their bikes or their rollerblades or walk. And this is happening around the US as well in Denver. And it's just a really great time to take the streets back. And then this example you all most likely recognize, it's Larimer Square. This is dining al fresco, and it's, it's about bringing people outside and, and repurposing the right of way for people instead of cars. And introducing, introducing art, culture, um, into the environment in very, very simple ways, but ways that connect with people and make people feel welcomed and can, they can use the space in a safe way. Um, the one on top, please, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's Ballroom Luminoso. 
Thank you. San Antonio. <laughs> also, which is so fantastic because the lighting scheme was done with, by an artist using um, parts to bicycles to create those light fixtures and then the ambiance. You could just tell, why wouldn't you want to hang out there and, and plan some event and do some programming that could happen there? Or the bottom left one where the culture is um, represented in the art that was invited to be uh, added to these underpass columns. And then it, the space is transformed into a welcoming space instead of a place that you really don't want to be. And then I don't know if anybody remembers, but back several years ago, we had an installation um, art project on 16th Street Mall. And this one was, this piece was really successful and has stayed there. And think about it now, it works perfectly for multiple people to sit on and not have to be too close to each other. And they can have conversations and watch people go by. And it's continued to be a very, a, serve, a well served space or place. And then I spotted this one on Broadway the other day that they'd taken a building and actually ripped the roof off of it. It's next to a um, brewery. I wish I could tell you what the name of the brewery was, but I thought it was so cool. I had to pull over and take a shot that here, here the, there are garage doors in those big um, old window, um, in the window facade, and the doors are still there, but this, the roof is gone. It's an exterior space that works interior and, and um, exterior wise and I think it's fantastic. People can space themselves really well and certainly when we move forward we can look for opportunities within the community to do this kind of place where there aren't other open spaces available where the the need for the outside space is there but we don't have a park or we don't have a street we can close down. Let's look for buildings that we could do this with. And then the one on the right that introduction of play which makes such a great impact and all this one was was paint. And you can play Pac-Man in any way you want with paint. <laughs> um, the, I, we found this one also and thought this was pretty interesting. When we move ahead, um, I think from, from now on, we're going to have to think of our right-of-ways in a different way. And the scale of the sidewalks, if we're working on the National Western Center right now and on the new area below I-70, and just the scale of the sidewalks to think through that and make sure the sidewalks are right enough and not to um, put too much of the right of way to cars. And then think about how it can be used in a temporary way or a permanent way to shut down for pedestrians in the middle, um, restaurants on the outside, plenty of room for everyone to spread out. It's, a, it's an environment to be capitalized on as we move forward. And then when we address culture, culture is increasingly local. For example, we can't go to Red Rocks anymore. Well, I mean, we can, hopefully, but it's closed for the season. And so culture and arts is going to have to be on a smaller scale, more local and um, sort of on even a neighborhood scale as opposed to a citywide scale. And so this actually is a great opportunity to showcase local artists or um, bands that maybe don't have the same exposure as big national um, attractions. And then um, if we're gonna integrate culture, it needs to be local and it needs to resonate with the people of whatever area that we're designing for. Um, here is a socially distanced movie night and then uh, an art market. I think that the really important thing on that one is to reach out to the community to see what they want and not try to dictate but actually um, our community engagement which we really always try to do but it's even more important now that we're making sure that we ask the neighbors and the people close by what they actually really need and want in these outdoor spaces that we're going to capitalize on. Um, just to get back to the idea of narrative, because that is something we think is a rich design tool and we don't want to forget it. This is a, an example that hopefully most of you have gone over to visit Paco Sanchez Park, phase one. There's a big tower, a play tower there, and the, the narrative came from Paco himself. So it was a connection. The people of that neighborhood wanted to honor Paco. He was a very important figure, the very first um, Spanish-speaking DJ in Denver. He, he opened a radio station in his home. He went on to be a community leader, a state, rep state representative, and was really important to the Latino community of Denver. 
So when we just started to design this tower, we wanted to harken back to him and we came up with this theme of broadcasting. So the tower is actually, I know a lot of people call it the beehive, but it's actually a mic tower, a giant old fashioned microphone. And you'll see throughout the design of the park, different references that refer back to that idea of broadcasting, like the gramophone slide and the trace ondas um, play pod and trace ondas sonoris, excuse me, play pod. So anyway, that idea of theme is a rich way to connect the culture and community. Oh, there it is finished in case none of you have seen it yet, but if you haven't, you gotta go. And, and that idea that spaces allow for discovery, they could be like we we're just saying, small interventions. They don't have to be giant size. They don't have to be Paco Sanchez Park. They can be a be an interesting bench, bench that gets you, um, makes you sit down and try to discover how it works, a, a pop-up library, um, coverings over the over an alley so that it makes it an inviting place to discover art with paint, exercise equipment, although exercise equipment might be a little bit hard if you don't have some kind of wipe down option for people to use. But that idea that you can discover things and you're attracted back to the space to see what might happen next, what might be there the next time you come. And I think one of the key things about discovery and play is that it makes us behave in a different way. And when we're out of our comfort zone a little bit, or we are tempted to run over a hill or sit down on a strange bench, we're more likely to engage. It, it forces in connections and we're more likely to say to another passerby, oh, this is interesting, or um, sort of connect with other people. Yeah, and also watch people, just to, the idea of being able to sit there. I mean, after listening to that interview those kids did, just watching other people enjoying themselves means a lot. Um, bringing play into the street, we, up in Boulder, that's always been there, but it's been a very successful thing and it's something we can replicate as we move forward. But also just finding places where play can be adapted, like on the bridge on the top one, that it's, a, it's an added environment. Um, the one on the bottom, what I love about that is that when you introduce something as simple as a chess game, you're, in, you're inviting 20 more people to be involved, not just those that are playing the chess, but the kibitzers on the side, those that are standing there going, I think you should do this, I think you should do that. And it's really great for um, more different age groups, especially people that are in their um, elder years. This is a very popular addition. Anything else, Louise? No, I don't okay. think so. And, and then that idea that play, like Louise was saying, that it is, it is something that brings people together. It makes us all um, react with each, or connect with each other, talk to each other, um, laugh. What could be better than that? And it, can, it doesn't have to be in a playground. It can happen anywhere within buildings and in our exterior public realm. Right, like slides for fire escapes or... <laughs> fun things like that. Um, and then programming. Programming is really important to getting people into space, staying in space and connecting. And obviously this is a little more difficult now because we're having to be socially distanced from each other. Um, here you can see an outdoor yoga, pop-up yoga class and again Larima. Um, but we can also, we can distance ourselves from each other through delineated spaces. So this is New York. There's circles for each person. Um, stay in your circle and you'll be safe. Um, and then this other picture on the right, this is one of my students did this. Um, her name was Tatum Mura and she did a study on CDC distancing guidelines and the amount of space that people need and how much uh, space, uh, how many people or what the capacity of a plaza is um, with social distancing norms as determined by C the CDC. So, so now we're going to jump into some case studies. Yeah, just a few case studies. <laughs> so Campus Marius Park we loved because it's, it, it displays all of those different things we were talking about as far as design opportunity. That it's a reclaimed space, it was just a big empty median in the middle of an urban setting in Detroit, totally underutilized and didn't attract or bring people from the nearby community or live downtown. 
to the, the to this space at all. And you can see now it is well. This was pre-COVID, but this space was is highly utilized by the community. And I think that the ideas that came from it um, can be applied in multiple places. For instance, the, the idea of the, the narrative here was this sculpture is actually in honors sailors. And then to, to carry on with that design idea, they brought in a beach, what we call the sailors. And the beach is a great, we, we love this idea because you could do this anywhere. You could put up some barriers or railroad ties around a space and dump a bunch of sand and you all, all of a sudden have a beach that brings kids and families and people downtown, sunbathers and players. And it's a, it's a wonderful application. It's been very successful there. And it's and then, cheap. And it's cheap, exactly. And it doesn't have to be forever. And then this space works all seasons because in the winter, back where that, um, where the, the tree is, is where the, where the statue it was. And here now it's an ice skating rink. So lay down on the same space and now you have an activity that is temporary for the, for the winter time that also to me feels like it would be incredibly safe with COVID. I mean, you could ask people to wear masks out here, which would, would be like your um, neck gear, you were skiing or something like that. And it would keep you warm as well as keep you safe. So a wonderful idea for future. And then we also thought about, well, um, just like Walmart is doing one-way systems in the aisles, maybe skating rinks could be skating ribbons and we could, we could promote that as a, um, a way to get people active and outdoors because as great as all of these pop-up ideas are, how we're, we're wondering how they're going to work through the winter. And, um, one thing we've talked about a lot and and this was such a great example of it, was the idea that, and, and Denver's already doing it, shut down certain blocks and met, let them become open spaces. And this is an example of one that was done um, two summers ago, I believe now. It was the square on 21st Street. And the image, of, it's in Arapahoe Square, an area that is very devoid of parks. They just don't have enough outdoor spaces. Lots of people, lots of dogs and no place to go. Um, so the street, you can see what the street looked like above when we go to the photo of showing it, how it was transformed, brought in a dog park, brought in some flexible open spaces, brought in art that's painted on the ground, rolled out artificial turf, brought in trees and planters, all of it that creates like a, a pop-up park. And it was so successful and the programming worked so well in it that it was extended from simply a month to three months. And we have this idea was why don't we move this around the city? make this a package that you keep in a container and um, take it to different parts of the city and close down blocks. Because one thing I noticed was in front of our office, when they closed down our street, right in front of our office for construction, all of a sudden our street became a promenade. Everybody was just walking up and down on 15th because there were no cars. So it's a wonderful opportunity to think of, think of as we move forward. And here it is transformed, you see that same street, just the introduction of paint, giving an artist a, a commission to do that, bringing in the, um, the trees. And then you can see that sign there, it announced different activities that were gonna happen during the different, over the month, so that everybody could come by and see. It allowed transportation to still go through, bikes were invited, cars could come through to drop off. So it was very flexible in its application, but made pedestrians feel like they were the first in line. And the community got involved. They were, they were part of it. They came in and helped plant. They came in and helped paint the, the uh, planters. So everybody got a part in deciding what was going to happen there. And there's the sign, upcoming events, games. Uh, the lawn area was used for cornhole and all sorts of different um, sporting games so that it was very engaging for all sorts of ages of people. And then the events were really interesting. They had, um, oh, there's a chess game again that I mentioned before. They had the dog park, um, which was really successful because people don't have places to take their dogs in that neighborhood. And I think we have one more slide of this, don't we, Louise? Yeah. Yeah, and then the silent disco and movie nights. Again, a pop-up thing that's so simple to do, but brings people together. And maybe on movie nights, you have circles on the ground that say dance in this circle, this circle, this circle, this circle. 
So you give yourself a little distancing. Um, so with this one, I think we just felt like can be applied um, just about anywhere. And then this is a this the pearl in um, I believe it's San Antonio. I, it's an it's an old brewery that was converted into kind of a market offices residential multi use space. Um, the reason that we we included this one is that we're a lot of a lot of people often say, well, how does this apply to me as an architect? And the answer to that is that you have the chance to influence your client. And if you're designing something like this, you can urge them to incorporate public outdoor space as an amenity to inc increase the value of the property because people do value parks and people do value having a place to take their dog and a place to sit outside, especially now with um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, yes, it will likely end, but we don't know what's coming next. And I think people are gonna be more receptive to having outdoor spaces and including outdoor spaces in their designs and their developments. And there's just another picture of um, the splash pad and some of the new trees. Laurel, do you have anything on that? No, but you know, one thing like, when you think about Denver Union Station and the flexibility of that space, one thing that's wonderful about introducing water is that you can turn the water off and then that becomes a plaza that you can program and use for um, a different event completely than for kids playing in water. So the flexibility built into this design is really important. And then some questions to consider. Um, how do we respond to the need for people to connect in public spaces while needing to limit contact? And how do we get people to venues? So for example, some of the mountain um, bike parks are opening, but you still have to take a gondola to the base. So there's sort of constraints like that. Uh, where do you park? How do you accommodate the elderly and immune compromised? Because these people still need to be in public space um, for their own mental health. And how do we adapt activities for winter? How do we reprogram parks successfully for smaller gatherings while keeping it equitable? Um, and then these are some of our final thoughts. Um, you know, you, you can use these design strategies, reclamation, culture, narrative, discovery, play um, within streets, plazas, parks, rights of ways, buildings um, to create places for people to be outside safely. Um, places they want to go, places they want to stay, and foster social connection. I can go back to the, the questions page, I think, if we want to um, start with those. I don't know if there are any questions from the audience, but that's it from us. Thank you. Yeah, and we'd love to see, hear your thoughts, too, on what you think the answer to these questions are, because all of us need to um, brainstorm on these and come up with ideas. Thanks, Laurel and Louise. That was uh, a good presentation and it is a little bit different from what we saw last October. So um, there are some timeless principles that, that don't change and things that we need to adapt to. So it's, it's a good lesson to learn. Um, we can either start with these questions or I've got some um, queued up and ready to go and we even have a, a couple from our participants. So you tell me where you'd like to start. Well, on these, um... I'd love to hear what other people think. I don't know if they want the right answers, but why don't we hear the ones that you've got queued up since um, we've thought about these already and we can go to these if we need to. Sure. Um, so one question that we've had come in already is related to um, public infrastructure, especially in the right of way. And a lot of these solutions that you've been talking about today are really about taking space away from cars and giving them back to people. And um, those have been mostly temporary conversions or temporary closures of streets and, and using things like either painted lanes or cones to differentiate. Is it going to be easier to make those permanent or is it just a temporary thing? Well, traffic's down, so we don't need all this space for cars right now, but it'll go back to normal. Well, I have an opinion on that. I think if, <laughs> if there's the will, it will be done. And we just need to adopt 
the conviction in our government systems, our transportation systems, to believe that this is so essential that we have to make it work, and we will. Now, one thing we alluded to in this question, our questions was, if you don't allow cars to be as close, then how do you bring people to it? Where do they park? How do you accommodate that? But there are cities that have, have done this. For instance, Copenhagen. We were lucky to be able to go there last year. And Copenhagen made the, the it, back, back in the 60s, they had the same problems we had. And they decided that they're, they were losing urban population. They were, the downtown was not a place people wanted to be. So they decided to make pedestrians first actually bikes almost first, but put bikes and pedestrians first. They changed all their cross sections of all their streets. They narrowed their car lanes. They put in bike lanes on every single street within the downtown just about um, and out into the um, connecting roadways. They plow their bike lanes before they plow their pedestrian lanes, before they pl plow their um, car lanes. They changed all their lighting systems so that it works for um, you know, there's no right turn on red because you don't want to hit bikes, you don't want to hit pedestrians. They've changed their system, and now we think that it's always been that way, but it wasn't all that way, always that way. They made the commitment to do it. So I believe that if we do make the commitment, like keep Larimer closed forever, we'll figure out a way to make the traffic system work so that Larimer can be closed, and it doesn't have to be um, an auto street. I, I would say that I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I think one of the biggest barriers to, to closing down streets is business owners and maybe residents are afraid of what it will do. They're afraid people won't have a place to park. They're afraid their business will suffer. Um, but we have a great opportunity right now to do that and to showcase how it can work in a temporary way. And I think maybe people will be more amenable to it afterwards. Um, one of the things that we're doing at um, CEU in the fall is an, another interdisciplinary studio, which we're calling EDEN, um, which is landscape architecture planning and urban design. And we are looking at converting streets to public realm, and we're gonna install a prototype. And um, the idea is that this would eventually become a huge connected network of public space for people, but, um, we're working with the city, we're working with Dodi, we're working with RTD, and I'm, I'm excited about it and I'm hopeful the city is open to it, they want to do it, they've relaxed regulations right now, so I think this is an opportunity that we need to, to take and, and try and make it, you know, make change with. Yeah, and another example that we're already, the city's already proceeding with is the 5280 loop which is actually gonna take 21st Street, that, that pop-up park, which was the experiment, and make it into a green street that will be part park, part um, bicycles, uh, trail system, pedestrian system, and it's gonna be part of an entire loop system that goes around the, the um, whole downtown. And I believe it's about mm, five to eight miles long, I can't remember, but um, that is taking a strategy that cars are not going to rain on those streets. It's going to be pedestrians and bikes. Yeah. We've got another question from an attendee. Um, some jurisdictions require a percent of construction costs set aside for art. It seems like with new understandings given by COVID that we should advocate for a percent set aside for vibrant outdoor spaces. What are your thoughts on this? Hmm. So when you do a construction project, you have to have a certain amount go to open space improvements. I think that's what the person's suggesting, correct? Or um, uh, publicly accessible, um, not, not just a blank slate of open space, but something programmed. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's tough because there are examples in Denver of public space associated with buildings that are just awful and um, then there are other examples that work fairly well. So I think it's about, um, yeah, the programming does help, but it's a really tough one because people can get around it if they don't want to do it. But what I think is sort of interesting, I'm not sure this is what the, the person was getting at, was to use the money to actually pay for the programming. Because 
the art program works really well. I mean, I've been part of that many multiple times. Um, but if you had a budget that you could then use to program your space as you move forward, that would be an interesting thing that the, that the, the, the um, developer or the owner would have that budget that they need to use. I don't know how long it would last, but at least use it for a while to program the space with activities that would attract people. It's an interesting thought. And one thing that's interesting is we had an image in here that we actually took out, but it was uh, it's a parking garage that has a park on the top and the money generated, the profits from the parking garage pay for the park maintenance and programming in the park. So that's kind of a legislative thing that needs to, or that could happen to say, if you know, for however much roof space, or if you're building a new building, you have to include X amount of open space on the ground or, you know, on the rooftop. We're seeing a lot of those on the, on the private side where business improvement districts or downtown partnerships will have uh, the, the vendors or the, their members will pay into a fund to keep up with maintenance and programming. And things like that. Right. There's a new, there's a, actually a new maintenance district that's in lower downtown around um, Skyline Park. It's a landscape maintenance district. I, I can't remember the exact name of it. I'm sorry, but that's exactly what it is. And all the businesses um, contribute to it. And it is part of creating the improvements that are going to happen on Skyline. And, that reminds me of Louise mentioned the garage roof. That's one that um, we didn't get Skyline darn, but <laughs> in the redesign, one of the things we were recommended is they use the adjacent garage roof as a potential of play or an environment to be on that would engage with the street level to get people up because you can have a better view and another whole activity space that can engage with the park or the park itself. The follow-up comment from that question was, uh, it could include a programming endowment, but importantly, like for the art percentage set-asides, there would be a competition by design specialists to do these spaces. Ah, free design again. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, no, if you've got a percentage. Um, well, you have to win, though, then. No, I know it's an interesting idea. And certainly there's a lot of people out there looking for um, ways to get work and be involved. And um, I think it would be really interesting. I mean, actually Paco Sanchez Park was originally a design competition, a national competition. And it was for reimagining play, and doing play in a very different way than it had been done before. So there's potential in it. I think what's gonna happen on the private side of development is gonna change even if the public side doesn't because um, if if we're facing COVID-19 this year and COVID-20 next year and something else the year after that I mean people don't developers are going to have a really hard time selling homes that don't have access to outdoor spaces whether it's a patio or a balcony or even a shared communal space within the development so um, if and I that's one of the things Mike that I think is so important about downtown because We've, we've made this progress in getting our city full, full of residents downtown. We, I can't remember the numbers, but the numbers are huge as far as how many more residents are downtown. We don't want to lose them. And if we don't create outdoor spaces that they can take their dogs and take their kids and be comfortable in, we're going to lose people. There's going to be a flight like we had in past generations and people will move out of the city. We don't want to see that happen. Yeah. Yeah, density only works if you have places to be out of your compact space um, on an irregular basis, especially if, if that's where you're living and working, you know, 24 seven. Right. Well, and the, the one thing that the city has going for it is that um, you, you don't have to take public transport to get there if you live there. Mm -hmm. So if you want to live in the suburbs, now you have to drive your car or well, you don't have to, but I certainly don't want to get on a train right now and be, you know, close to, to other people. Um, and so there's sort of, there is a dynamic that the city, the city has an advantage, but the lack of green space in downtown Denver is, I mean, it, it's almost backwards. Like there, the green space, or the green network maybe was not prioritized, um, maybe because it's a public project and the, you know, the housing was largely private. 
Do you think some of the um, shared streets and the repurposed public infrastructure might change in the programming to where it's going to be more geared toward um, individual or family unit activities rather than, you know, a, a variety of different folks from households coming together and, and all the kids playing together? Um, and the, the reason I ask is because the, all the public health guidance says, you know, stay within your circle of people um, in order to, you know, mitigate exposure. And so much of the public infrastructure that is geared toward play is for these, you know, um, unplanned gatherings of people from disparate households and neighborhoods, which is a good thing. And, and we don't want to not encourage that, but I think people will self-regulate themselves a little bit. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting one. And I, I'm thinking about that with um, Paco going to be opening its second phase um, at the end of the summer. And that's a big park, so it's different than being downtown. But um, one of the, the wonderful things about the design is that it, it's a loop play system where there's a series of play um, pods that happen along the loop. And it goes all the way up and down the park with, you know, about a 45 but grade change, which is unusual in Denver. Um, but I, I've been thinking about it, how great that's gonna be because if it feels too crowded in one part of the play, families will be able to move to another one and another one and another one. And we, they won't have to feel like they're, you're, they're uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's the flexibility we're gonna have to design into any public spaces while still providing places that are comfortable, um, shaded, you know, as climate's warmer, these places have to be where people can feel like they can sit for a while and watch and whatever other people are doing, but be in a comfortable environment. One thing we talked about when we were preparing this too is that the addition of trees, the addition of open space increases property values. Any, any um, developer or homeowner, when you live on a street or you have a business on a street that has trees, um, your business, your rents are higher. People want to go there more. There's better mental health. Their impacts of that are so great that we just keep, have to keep reminding um, the powers that be that the investment is worth it. And I think there's, you know, one of the, if we talk about closing streets, it the success of that is going to be whether or not local people are involved and take ownership of the streets, because if they don't, and um, it, it won't work. And I think all across the US and, and less so the world, but I think there's a huge move to um, stay local, uh, grassroots kind of communities change from the neighborhood up. People don't want, uh, I think there's, people are banding together at a, at a grassroots level to, to make change happen. And I think that's really exciting for how this it could change the fabric of the city. But I mean, when, yeah, a play on a large scale like that is, um, it's tough because, I mean, Laurel and I were looking at the Paco pictures and we were like, oh my gosh, it's just, it's so over the top. Like, you know, it's so, it's so big and it's so central and it's, it's like Disney World, like you, you know, like, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to go take your kids there right now there's just too many people so it's about bringing back to a smaller scale and i mean I, I think one of my favorite things about um like a city like denver is that there are actually lots of little things that make the fabric of the city cool like from from the cu building you look out and you can see the the big pen oh i don't know if it's big but there's a pencil on a rooftop in the distance i'm not sure if you're familiar with it but you know, like little surprises of art or the cats at Larimer Square or the, you know, the faces and, and, and those small art installations and small spaces to sit and find are what make a city, the fabric of a city cool. It's not the one giant statue in the middle of the city. So I think it's a great opportunity to really make our cities more local. When you change the use of a public amenity, it has to be used by that new, um, purpose, right. but it can't be overused in today's context where people will say, oh, well, it's not safe. You know, you'll have the Yogi Berra thing happening where nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. 
<laughs> well, and the other thing is, you know, when we talk about loneliness and the, you know, the 18 to 20, 22 year olds being the loneliest generation, um, that's also who COVID I think has been really, really hard on is young, uh, young single people who don't have a family unit to connect with and stay with. And that's who you see in the public realm right now is groups of young people walking around without masks because they're craving that in human connection and interaction. They don't want to stay home. And so, you know, when it comes to programming, maybe it's different for different age groups. Yeah. Or and distancing is different for different age groups. And the pandemic you know, exacerbates all the underlying conditions that were there before, whether it's loneliness or social isolation, which I hate, you know, say the phrase social distancing. It's, we shouldn't be social distancing, we should be physically distanced. Yes, I agree. <laughs> physical distancing. But I mean, the feedback I get from my students is, you know, college without the social connection is really awful. You know, they're, they're, a lot of them have had to move back to their parents' houses. So now they're living in their parents' house like it's high school and they're working and they're not connecting with any of their friends. And it's, I mean, they're expressing a lot of anxiety and stress over that. It's not fun. I'm, I'm participating in another um, presentation this afternoon in, a, in an hour. And uh, <laughs> one of the questions they asked me was, how do you make um, the public realm safe? For instance, um, they use as an example Civic Park or um, Denver Union Station because both those places are ideally designed to be used by many people in many different ways and yet we find um, this attitude of move along, move along, move along, you know, don't, don't gather here and I'm sure with COVID it's even more um, an issue. So I had this really funny idea, and I'm, I'm not sure it's a good idea, but I kind of like my idea, that we should institute the idea of, because people don't have jobs and we could employ people, the idea of a safety patrol. I don't know, you're all probably too young to remember safety patrols in school, but when I went to school, I was a safety patrol, and I got to wear an orange thing across my, you know, kind of like in a Miss America badge around, that went around my waist, and I got to stand in the hall and I tell, told people, to slow down or stop pushing or, you know, whatever. But I have this feeling that, you know, we have this problem with police. We don't want people out there with guns. What if we had a, a you know, I've seen Good Samaritan groups that walk around, but that idea that there's a group of people that are trained, they're trained in drug abuse, they're trained in mental health issues, they're trained in um, conflict negotiation and, they're not just single by themselves because that wouldn't work, but that they're out in public spaces encouraging people to have good, plain fun, but not create problems that make other people feel unsafe. So that's my idea. I don't know if anybody likes it, but I kind of do. <laughs> They've got robotic dogs that are gonna do that now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well then, and the safety patrol could have dogs that are really nice for people to come up and talk to and pet them, you know, because that's healthy, so. Um, you've mentioned, you know, context sensitivity is obviously something that you want to continue to do. And, and some of the, the, the desire for restaurants, for example, or other um, the temporary closures to get something done quickly um, are, are real plug and play. You know, they're not necessarily context sensitive or um, where you've got buildings that might be boarded up that they'll cover with art. So how can we continue to be aware of the cultural and neighborhood context when we're designing even temporary interventions? Yeah, you know, that worries me. I was thinking about that with Larimer Square because Larimer Square, yeah, great example, wonderful, wonderful, but those restaurants are expensive, right? So how many people is that open to? So how do we create that kind of um, situation where the food is, um, a taco truck and a barbecue truck and you know so it's it's reasonable for a whole bunch of people and maybe that's what it is we we target neighborhoods who that need an outdoor space and we choose a block and we close it down and we invite the food trucks in um that kind of thing i don't know louise do you have other ideas yeah it's a really tough one because as soon as you close a street down then it's a it's a paternal approach so you really want it to come from the neighborhood um 
but it's really difficult to do community engagement right now uh, because you know nobody wants to speak to anybody nobody wants to touch communal pens things like that um so one of the i mean larimer square also is most of the buildings are owned by one entity and so it's much easier to kind of get everyone on board and and to apply for these things and there's also already there's a precedent for closing down the street at larimer and um, that's one of the things we've been grappling with you know is we're using LARM as a precedent for a precedent study for our um, studio for the fall, but it's really unique. It's really wealthy. It attracts a totally different type of clientele. And so on the one hand, we're like, well, we can't really use it because it's not really applicable in another situation. But on the other hand, it's aspirational and people like it and would like something like that in their neighborhood. So do you do Larima and then say, well, we could bring something like this here. Or do you say, no, we're going to reinvent it for your neighborhood with your input. So the, these are just some of the questions that we're asking and that we're dealing with. And um, I mean, I think I think there were there was Larima, there was Tennyson, and there was 16th and Glenarm were the streets that applied for closure. Um, Tennyson, I think, didn't end up happening. I don't know whether they couldn't get buy-in. Um, so it's Glenarm and Larima, and it's really, really a very small population that that will benefit. Um, One thing, Louise, we found at Big that. Um, that community engagement thing, we, we were really worried about it, but we've continued to have projects that have community engagement um, components to them. And in some ways it's worked really, really well because people who are afraid to raise their hand in a group setting or stand up and speak at the microphone to ask a question, because they can ask questions um, online just in a chat aspect, we've really gotten good involvement. Right. Down in Englewood, we're doing an Englewood um, uh, redevelopment plan or, or urban design plan, and the participation in the meetings has been very good. So there is hope in that. And it's done through a Zoom meeting? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you know, I obviously you don't want to judge, but do the people in Englewood mostly have access to internet and Zoom? Right. So how do, you, how do you do that in a neighborhood where people maybe don't, or like where one of the things we we're thinking about was like QR codes, um, you scan a QR code, do you answer a survey online through a card, things like that. Um, do you speak into an audio device or like, is there a tape recorder set up that you can say your piece into? Lots of interesting Challenges. ideas. Mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can package it for a mobile phone, that's there's not a big digital divide there but it's true right bandwidth that has the issue sure um, and there's some really i don't know if people would be comfortable you know sharing you know pens or chalkboards obviously but there's some really great physical things as well for uh you know there's that i wish this was format um, yeah so it's going to change how we do that stakeholder engagement um, and, and maybe for the better, because as you, you're equalizing and democratizing all the participants. Right, you right. That's it. The hope is. A town hall context where you have a, a table of the dignitaries who are waiting to hear from some people what, what they have to say. Well, this is a great conversation. I'm sure we could continue to talk about it for a long time. Um, I want to end with a couple of thoughts that are, that are layered on to COVID. Um, so the first would be, is the, is the use of those common or shared um, furnishings, fixtures and equipment going to, going to change on the manufacturing side or the, or the um, you know, are, are there ways to either have a maintenance protocol or have antibacterial microbial type finishes that you're starting to see? Because um, you don't want to totally take out playground equipment and, and have, and, and not do temporary rentals of bikes or kayaks or things like that, that that really activate these spaces that people love because they don't want to, you know, touch something that's shared. Um, so anything you're seeing there, we'll start with that. Well, maybe this is wishful thinking, but what I've been hearing lately is that the conveyance of at least this germ does not happen on services, that it happens through um, speaking, coughing, the, that aspect and the, the, the length of um, 
its longevity on a surface is very, very slight. So I would think it's more important, like in the Paco Tower, the kids are up there together, near each other, they're talking, they're laughing, and that's where the conveyance is gonna happen. I don't think it's gonna be on the materiality of the, the play equipment itself. So in that regard, I mean, masks are wonderful, but people aren't putting their kids in masks in Paco ta Paco's Tower, I'm sure. Um, there's the idea that I've seen this in a couple places where there's um, a hand sanitizer. They're actually, they're, they're pretty portable. There are these giant boxes with hand sanitizer that can be brought to a place and put out there and, you know, in the short term until these, they come up with more um, long-term solutions to that. Um, but I think it goes to an, in a, on an individual's um, responsibility. I really do at the moment. And then more research as to how really, how this particular disease is transmitted. Of course, then there's the next one we're gonna run into at some point and that'll be different. So I have not seen anything yet as far as materiality. I've seen, it's interesting though, all the um, exterior outdoor furniture companies are, are doing new ads, just like you're seeing on TV for ads that relate to this. They're doing ads on how their furniture groupings can work to create some distancing, which is interesting. They're already coming out with that kind of advertisements. And I think some positive, well, everyone has different sort of um, ideas on the scooters, you know, Lyft and Lime. And um, I, I was sort of hopeful that this pandemic would be the end of them, um, <laughs> you know, in downtown. And I mean, I, I had a personal, I was hit by a scooter um, when I was towing my, my son in a, in a bike trailer and I was on the bike path. And so I, I just think they're dangerous and, and people get hurt, but um, I was kind of hoping that this would be the end of them. So maybe some positive things could come out of that or we could rethink how to integrate them or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I want to end with an idea about, you know, it's something else that people are more mindful about being exacerbated by this crisis is um, reminders of where communities have faced historic disinvestment. And I think you're seeing that play out in a variety of ways. So do you think the ways that places make monuments or memorialize or do statuary is going to change um, in the programming aspect of it versus, you know, where we see the re I don't want to focus too much on what has been removed and torn down and then, you know, people have taken matters into their own hands and said, this is not our story and we don't want to, we don't want to validate that. What is the, what is the counter to that on the, on the proactive side that designers can do to program space that, that talk about that shared legacy that, that is aspirational. Well, you know, again, I hate, I hate to use Paco as an example, but it, it's such a great one because the fact that um, he came to the United States and that one of the first things that he noticed was that his, his local music and dancing wasn't represented in the community in Denver and he wanted it. And so he, he opened a, a dance hall before he did a DJ, a radio station and brought the dancing and the music to people. And then by honoring him, and like we have an artist that's doing an installation in Paco that is going to be three records that are stacked upon each other. And on one side, it's going to be written in Spanish. On the other side, it's going to be written in English. And it's going to be honoring what he did in the community, um, what was so important. And the only thing I would say that's, and that, that was located, Paco was located in a neighborhood that had been um, underserved. It, that park was not well used. It was not, had not been, um, had any monetary investment in it in decades. And in fact, it was a landfill originally, um, kind of a landfill, an urban fill. Um, but the downfall, of course, what has happened since it's such an incredible park now is that a lot of the housing around it has gentrified and changed. And therefore, it's not serving the community that it was supposed to serve as well. But on the good side, there's been a, a big new apartment building built right near it that is serving um, low income housing. And actually I think uh, some health, mental health issue residents. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then there's another, there's several housing communities around there that will not be displaced. So that is the good news in the gentrification story. 
That's not answering your question exactly, but it's a it's uh, an interesting one. Uh, yeah, and I, statues are always a tough one, and I think oftentimes they're poorly poorly researched, and they don't always. They, for me, it's about equitable representation, um, and I I would just say like let's not let's not have any statues of people like no no one person needs to be memorialized in that way um there's so, there's so many wonderful artists there there we're not doing statues nearly as much but it's almost like this strange phenomenon in history where people wanted statues of themselves to make themselves famous or more important Absolutely. or live forever and i just don't i don't know i, I it's interesting because I, I studied at LSU and LSU has a no statues on campus policy, but then Shaquille O'Neal said he would give some ridiculous amount of money for an indoor basketball arena if they put a statue of him outside. And so they said, okay, so what can you well, do? And then the public art, the, the funds for public art that someone brought up earlier, I mean, that program, the, the public art program in Denver, is run by a competition program. And I think in that regard, that one is great because the, the way that the gentleman won, the, the one, the art that got, is going in Paco is that it was, a, you know, everybody got to apply and he happened to be, um, he's a teacher at actually at, um, at Metro, I believe. He's an art teacher, but um, he happens to be Latino, but we didn't know that when we originally picked the winner, the, you know, the ones that were going to be considered as winners. So it is a very um, inclusive process to bring art into the community that everybody is open to applying. And maybe there's a way to make that even better by making sure there's a percentage that of disadvantaged people that are represented in the winners. And I, I like, you know, the Chicago, uh, the Crown Fountain at Millennium Park in Chicago, where you can take a picture of your face and then it gets put up onto these big screens and the water comes out of your mouth. Like, that's what I want to see. I don't, I, I think that statuaries uh, and statues, there's no interaction, there's no play, unless it's something you can actually climb on. They really serve no purpose other than to promote the person that they're depicting. So I'm pretty against oh, them. <laughs> yeah, all of them can be really playful, like the big bear. Yeah, but that's not a person. You're right, it's not a person. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And the Chicago one was pretty low tech and not uh, labor intensive. They literally um, just pulled people off the sidewalk. Um, yeah. We thought would, would look like different parts of the city. In fact, I was uh, the secretary of the AI Illinois board was one of those faces that was walking down the street with his son. And yeah, really? Really? On a cycle of the, of the fountain. So. I mean, yeah, it's a great way to represent the community. And we, we need to do more of that. Well, it's uh, all of this is a reminder that social connections are are as vital now as they've ever been, and there are new ways of providing it. And it's not just for our own personal health; it's good for the professions that we serve as well, because a lot of these um, really well done interventions and permanent adaptations to public space uh, are good for architecture as well. So you mm -hmm. mentioned several of them. Um, we hope there's there's more to come. Um, I know there's a lot of debate about whether the High Line is actually a good thing or not, but the, the, uh, how much development it's brought and the kind of development, but you know, I'd, I'd rather be debating the upside and, and whether it is really there or not than still looking at an abandoned piece of public infrastructure that's overgrown with weeds. So um, more work to be done and more conversations to be had, and we appreciate you adding to this one today. So. Thank you both, Laurel and Louise, for your contributions. And uh, maybe we'll get to do it again in person sometime uh, in the future. Uh, Thank you. Stay, Thank you. Stay tuned. Uh, tomorrow we have a presentation on what architects need to know about the 2020 elections and easy ways to get involved, just in time for the, your, your mail-in ballots to be completed and sent in for this uh, primary election. And then next Tuesday we have a uh, presentation on sustainable design using precast concrete. So we hope to see you there. Same place uh, and same days of the week, noon in the virtual realm, Tuesday and Wednesday, tomorrow uh, this week and Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Thanks again and have a good rest of your week.